You good to go, Brett? All good to go, Mark. No worries. Well, um, good evening. Uh, my name's Jeff Minchin, Senior Ag Advisor with Local Land Services, working in the Drought Adoption Officer Program, and I will be your host this evening for tonight's webinar. Uh, welcome to tonight's event, and thank you for taking the time to join us uh, for this very topical session discussing early weaning for drive times uh, with our own Brett Littler from Local Land Services based at Mudgee. Before we get started tonight, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge that we are all dying in from what was and always will be Aboriginal land. I pay my respect to Wiradjuri people who are the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which I stand today and also extend that to the tr traditional custodians of who are, you are all representing today, um, as well as elders past, present and emerging. Just a quick acknowledgement of the funding sources that have been provided to um, to host these webinars. Um, so this, this webinar series, and this is number five, uh, has been part of a um, webinar series brought to you by our Saving Our Souls During Drought program. Um, and that has been funded through the Southern Innovation Drought Hub, um, and also through funding from the Future Drought Fund. Uh, the, um, the, the, the purpose of these webinars is to help producers across the state uh, and assist them in making decisions and management of livestock through the current dry period and dry times that we're experiencing, particularly on the north and eastern parts of the state. Other webinars in this series have all been recorded and you can access them by registering on the links to each of the webinars or heading across to our YouTube channel or social media uh, to, uh, to catch up on anything you may have missed over the last few weeks. If you, during tonight, you will, um, you'll see there's a little control panel on the side. If you have any questions, uh, please jump in there and um, add your questions into the questions tab. Uh, there will also be a few links um, either in the resource tab or with, uh, with the recording that you'll get sent tomorrow um, after everything has been finalised and finished. Um, so this evening, as I said, we've had Brett Littler from Local Land Services. In tonight's session, Brett's going to outline, outline some tips and strategies around early weaning of livestock, both sheep and cattle, um, discussing some things around better utilisation of feed resources, increased market flexibility and maintaining herd productivity and through fertility and longer recovery times. Brett is a Senior Land Service Officer in our Saving Our drought Soils During Drought program based at Mudgee. Brett has got over 25 years experience in livestock production, breeding and management as an extension officer and as a producer himself. So welcome Brett. Thanks very much Jeff. No worries, well we, uh, we might let you kick off. Thanks very much Mike. Um, four warns, four armed everyone. Um, uh, joys of uh, this the things that go on and uh, when we try to do these things. Uh, we've had a blackout here where I'm trying to do my presentation. Uh, so I've actually had to come out away from my desk um, to do the presentation outside. So apologies um, if there's a little bit of background noise uh, and the like, but uh, we'll, we'll see how we go. I'm currently hot spotting off a phone. So uh, We'll see how we go, Jeff. <laughs> you might end up having to do the back end of the slides, mate. <laughs> uh, no <okay>. worries. <laughs> uh, so we'll kick into it tonight. Really, um, uh, it's one of these things that uh, early weaning of lambs and calves that, that we we definitely see uh, really when we get into these dry times. Uh, we get uh, one of these questions, you know, how do I do it? What do I do? Um, and there's a lot of practical tips um, that go with it. There is really a lot of learning uh, that goes in and, and through this early weaning that we see. Um, and, but before you get in there, really, it's one of those things that I try to ask people, um, you know, to ask yourself a few feeding points. So why are you actually feeding? Um, and it's important to, to ask yourself that, that question. What are you trying to achieve? 
So when we're looking at early weaning, you know, what's our goal for these animals? What are we trying to achieve? Um, there's some critical things that we talk about. You know, we, we talk about weight gains. We like to get them to certain weights. Um, what are the issues with feeding? You know, be it um, what, what are the health challenges that we might run into? Uh, also, what are some of the issues with some of the feed products, different bits and pieces that we try to feed? How are we going to try to manage it? The setups that we've got, the water, et cetera. So ask yourself what those issues are, sit down, work it out. And also, are we doing it the right way, the best way and the cheapest way? Um, for me, uh, I, I tend to, for, for my situation on our farm, um, sometimes the, I'm not doing it the cheapest way, but I'm doing it the best way, which is the right way for me, because I spend a lot of time away from home. Uh, it's very hard working full time and then coming back and, and trying to feed very quickly. So. Yep, sometimes there's some cheaper, better options out there, but that's not the best method for me. It's not doesn't suit the gear that I've got um, or the system that, that I'm trying to implement. So, you know, these are sort of part of the way up of, of how you do it. Um, and, and I know, particularly when I look at early weaning, um, that, you know, sometimes it is there's some give and takes. Um, you know, we'd say this is what you should be doing, but this is what's going to work for you, which may not be exactly the gold standard or the best way of doing it, but it's going to be the way that works for you. Also, if you're looking at buying in feed and bringing in feed, it's important that you do it on an energy, protein and dry matter basis. I can't keep harping on this enough. Um, it's really important today, I was with some producers this afternoon and we were talking about some of the variation in some of the feeds that we've seen. Um, you know, so really sit down, work it out. A uh, question came up from, from one of the producers this afternoon saying, oh, I was thinking about this. I'm going, well, that's actually 50% dry matter. So instead of costing you X, Y, Z per tonne, it's, you have to double it on a dry matter basis. So, you know, really important that you do look at that energy, protein, and also dry matter basis. Also, um, you know, we, we do run into the issue with sometimes funny feeds. And I know I was talking to a vet earlier on the week that that had a funny feed and, and was saying, you know, this is what they're feeding, what's the possible issues. Um, we're getting some of these hays, you know, it might be good quality, but sometimes they just aren't suitable at times for these early one calves, they, unless you're putting them in total mixed rations, or they may have, have an issue. And, and today, uh, vet that I was working with mentioned about some issues we had in 2019 with, with millet hay and, and nitrate poisoning, you know, which happened to be in, in certain areas. Um, the other thing, if it sounds too good to be true, then it usually is. So really important that um, people are aware of that, um, that, you know, that it can be a really big issue that sometimes some of these things, um, you know, we get a pretty big hard sales pitch done to us on different things. And, you know, when you sit down and sort of go, okay, is, is it right? Um, uh, yes or no? Uh, find out, ask some questions. You know, if invariably, if it sounds too good to be true, then it really is. Um, I've, I've, in my career, I've had times where I've had people say, you can feed this, and, and you'll be fine. Uh, but other times we, we do run into some big issues with some of these feeds. What I would say is there's a number of different tools that we do use when we're doing using uh, things like trying to give this advice. One of the ones that, that I really do advise producers to look at is the drought feed calculator. It's a great tool. Um, there, there is some upgrades happening to it at the moment. Um, just a couple of things to be aware of. You need to factor in waste. Waste is one of these things, you know, particularly when we're looking at feeding, um, depending on the, the way, the method that you're feeding, sometimes waste can be quite high. We talk about, you know, uh, sometimes grain, we'll look at five, 6% grain, but at times I've seen up to 30% waste given the correct, well, incorrect feeding uh, or, or poor site, poor methods, et cetera. Um, 
The other one that I would say is poor sampling of food can have a real real effect. And, and this afternoon we were talking with a group of farmers and I talked about some of my experience with some feeds that, you know, people haven't correctly sampled that feed and, you know, they've gone and used that information. When we've gone and done tests, we haven't seen that same results. So be a bit careful if you're doing your own feed tests that you do take the time to do good, good feed sampling to ensure good numbers. But the drought feed calculator, great tool. The other one that that's out there is the drought and supplementary feed calculator. It's a very useful tool for those of you lucky enough to, to have a bit of feed. It, it enables you to put in your pasture side of things uh, and look at that in comparison to the animals and, and then sort of say, okay, how much do we actually need to supplement in? What I would say with this, like with any of these tools that are out there, garbage in equals garbage out. So if you don't assess those pastures correctly, you know, you're too generous or too kind with, with what's there, it really can affect what you see at the back end. The other one that I talk about and I use regularly, I have this running pretty much regularly on my computer for any of the, the questions that I tend to, you know, phone calls and the inquiries that I tend to get. I, I use this all the time, it's a food cost calculator. I find it an extremely useful tool for me when, when I'm trying to work through and look at different feeds and compare one to the other very quickly. But more importantly, when I'm trying to make up a mix, particularly when I'm talking about early weaning, where I talk about minimum proteins, minimum energies, that I want X, Y, Z of protein for these animals, I want X, Y, Z of protein of these ones. It, it is a tool that I use all the time. It's very, very easy to make little changes um, with things like you know your, your legumes, et cetera, hay, change that around and change the percentages to have a real big, uh, to show the variation. Um, even this morning talking to someone before I took off, they were asking me a question of how many, how many, what percentage of fibre beans should they have in their mix? Um, and, and it was pretty easy for me to say, look, fibre beans, yes, they're 26%, et cetera, et cetera, but this is how much you should have in, your, in that mix. So what is early weaning? Early weaning's been around for, for a long time. Um, you know, it's, it's been a great tool in the toolbox that we use, but early weaning for me is weaning earlier than normal or ideal during, during conditions that warrant the practice. Um, I, look, in saying that, I think there's a lot of benefits of, of weaning early regularly. Um, but what we tend to see is during those droughts is that we see people really going in very, very early. Um, but for me, early weaning uh, is normally what we talk about is 14 weeks after the staff start of lambing for lambs uh, or a six week lambing or before six to seven months for cattle. And, and that's for me, when I'm talking about early weaning, that's where I'm, I'm talking about. Um, there's obviously different steps in that early weaning, uh, but you know, early weaning is a great way to manipulate uh, the nutritional requirements of our cows and our ewes. Um, and, and it's a great way to manage those cows and ewes. Um, so it's definitely a, a great tool for the toolbox. And, and as someone who messaged me this morning um, saying, you know, it, pushing it, that can be used regularly to, to treat those cows and use as dry animals. Why early weaning? Really, feeding a lamb and a calf through a, a dam or a ewe is, is very inefficient. Um, uh, there's, you know, because there's only an hour for this webinar, I, I won't go into it fully, but there's there's a, a lot of inefficiency there where we start to get the, when these lambs, you start to get up, they start to compete with their mums. There's inefficiency, you know, they've lost the esophageal grooves, so all of a sudden they're, they're ruminating, so that milk moving through. So it, it, it really is inefficient. Um, what I do know is once they get up, it doesn't matter how I do my sums and how I break my sums down, it always is more efficient to split a calf and a lamb off a cow and a ewe rather than try to feed that lamb or calf 
via the U or the care. You know, it always doesn't matter how you do the sums, it always works out that way. It also allows better allocation for limited feed resources. All of a sudden, you know, and even at home, I saw this with, with our weaners at home. We early weaned, we were able to put those calves in a paddock that we'd had saved, um, put them in there after we'd had a couple of weeks locked up, feeding them, get them out onto what little green food we'd had. And, and they did really well over a period of time. If I had taken those cows and calves and put their, that feed with what the amount that we had there and the cows that we would have put in there, that would have been struggling to last us two weeks. Whereas all of a sudden we were able to get a month and a bit out of that paddock before we had to move those weaners into another paddock and really started to step up our feeding. So, you know, it really allows us to better allocate that limited food resource. You know, if you've got a little paddock of loose and et cetera, et cetera, you know, it helps you work that out. The other thing about it is cows and ewes get by on, on less energy and protein content. You know, they really require less. Um, and what we see, and even so, I saw this at home uh, this year, was all of a sudden, I put cows in the paddocks and I'm going, okay, we better watch these. And all of a sudden they picked up, they improved, they bloomed, and all of a sudden we saw a fair bit of uh, that free nutritional kick that we tend to get because all of a sudden these animals don't require such a high quality feed. The other big thing about it is we maintain that fat or condition on those cows and ewes and it really does help those, those females get back in calf, keeps that fat on them. We don't have to you know, manage them quite as closely um, and, and, and put in the interventions to help lift or look at spike feeding and things like that. So really we look got that longer recovery if we don't um, try to maintain that herd, herd fertility. So when I talk about ewe and cow performance, these are just some numbers and look, they're, they're the rough off the back of the envelope. They're, what we're looking at a minimum ME, seven to eight ME for, for a cow and a calf to, for survival. <coughs> Crude protein, six to 9%. If we're looking at pregnancy, eight and eight, nine. But once we get into that lactating, really, I'm looking at an ME of 10 and a, and a protein of 12 as, as a minimum. And to give you a bit of an idea, um, we're seeing a number of haze from last year that, uh, you know, are only just seven or eight MEs and only got proteins of, of um, six to nine. So even putting lactating cows on that hay as much as they can physically eat, the cows and ewes, we're still going to see them lose weight and, and the like. So really, um, you know, that quality of feed is diminished if, if we treat that animal as a dry animal rather than keep her lactating and trying to feed that calf or the lamb. Just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, ewes on the left, uh, cows on the right, um, what you can see there is, you know, if we look at a, a 50 kilo ewe dry, she's only going to need roughly around about seven ME. Um, pregnant, you know, she's going to be up, up sort of getting close to that requirement of, of uh, 12 ME. If she's lactating, 18 to 19 ME. You know, so you can really see that that increase in, in megajoules per day that that cow require, the the ewe requires. Cows, you can really see that, you know, a cow, 500 kilo cow, 60, 60 plus ME. If she's pregnant in that last little bit of pregnancy, um, you know, she's getting up over 80. All of a sudden, if she's lactating, you're more or less doubling it out and it's getting up to roughly around about 120. So really, you can see the importance of, you know, trying to minimise what we're having to feed these cows and use if, if we're still in that situation, we haven't got the feed in the paddock where we're trying to, to feed them. Um, it's important that we make these ewes and cows dry as quick as we can. Why early wean? We better utilise that high quality pasture. We can better use the, utilise supplementary feeds. The other thing we save water, which, which a lot of people um, don't tend to think about. Um, and we increase our market flexibility. 
So if we've got those calves early weaned, we've looked after, done the right thing with them, all of a sudden by doing that, we're able to, particularly if we're doing the right thing, fed them well, looked after them well, we've all of a sudden got the flexibility. Uh, we've also got cows that we're not trying to splinter, cows and ewes that we're not trying to, you know, um, sell just just as we're starting to wean and splintering calves and lambs off. So it really does help us with that marketing, but really the big benefits is we can better use the supplementary feed, but also there's a decrease in water requirements by stopping that cow or ewe from lactate. When should you early wean? And and this is always the, the question that I get asked, you know, when should should I early wean? How quick should I go? And what I always say is it depends. It depends on the circumstance. It depends on the spread of the, the calving and lambing. But really, it is the condition of the ewe and the cow that really dictates that decision. Um, if, if I've got cows um, that, that are starting to slip down into to, you know, low end fat score two and starting to drop into a fat score one, that's really telling me that I need to be thinking about pulling the trigger and going. Um, you know, I'm not going to be able to pick those cows up with that calf on them. You know, I need to pull that trigger. All of a sudden, if we're trying to lift a cow and a ewe up a fat score, um, you know, average size 50 kilo ewe, lift her up a fat score is, is roughly around about seven kilos. You know, that takes a bit of time. If we're looking at cow, same story, 500 kilo cow, 70 to 80 kilos that you're trying to lift is a fat score. So it can take a fair bit of effort. So the cow condition really dictates when we're going to do that. Marking of weaners, um, when we're going to do it, you know, there's pros and cons of, of knife, ring, um, you know, dehorn. But, you know, I know at home we marked three three weeks before we weaned. So we had it, gave those animals a chance to heal up, get over it. We'd given them a vaccine. We are able to treat those animals. And then we, we went in and, and that's when we weaned. The other thing is, have they been imprinted and educated on what you're going to feed? Um, this is really important with sheep, but I really believe it's also important with cattle. And, and I know dealing with a few guys that I've dealt with, well, producers I've dealt with over the years, um, that, you know, it really is something that's really important. And what you're going to feed those early wean calves and lambs should be what you try to introduce out in the paddock. I had a case with some sheep a few years ago where... The producer had been using faba beans, he got lupins, um, and I was, went out to this and I couldn't believe that these lambs in a lick feeder had been able to push the lupins out. They weren't touching. Uh, we had some issues going on there, that's why I was out there, but you could really see that, you know, they weren't, they didn't know what it was, they didn't, hadn't tried to eat it, and all of a sudden they were sorting. So really important, if you're going to feed them on something, show it to them out in the paddock. Um, and, and the like. If you're going to early wean, you need to feed for growth, not maintenance. It's, it's, it's really, this is critical. I can't sort of stipulate it enough. We need to be getting good growth for these animals. We need to be having them tick along. The faster they grow, the one thing we've learned in 17, 18, 19 is the less health issues that we have. Um, you know, if we talk about point half, uh, uh, half a kilo per day for, for weaners, weaner cattle, um, that's great. But I know if I can get them up at 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and I know this people go, oh, that's pushing them along. That is, but we know we get less health issues and less problems. Same with lambs. That, you know, if we can get them up over that 100 grams, closer to 150, the better the performance, the less issues that we tend to have. So. Really, if you're going to feed these calves and early wean and lambs, you really need to feed for growth. So it's not maintenance, it's nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. Just can't stipulate that, you know, anymore. Weaning lamb. So, look, um, by roughly three weeks of age, a lamb's feed conversion efficiency is greater than the ewes. 
um, by eight weeks of age, the, the lamb is receiving more nutrients from pastures. We, we know that, you know, so it's, it's one of those ones. By 12 weeks of age, the lamb is consuming very, very little wheat milk and is actively competing against you for available food. You know, so that's that's sort of giving you a bit of an indication of, you know, sort of where we start to think we, we can start the early wine. Early weaned lambs, look, we know lambs have been successfully weaned as light as 10 kilos live weight and under a month old. Um, really for me, oh, I look at that eight weeks of age as, as a minimum and, and minimum weight of 10 kilos. Um, but really, you know, anything I can get them heavier up to that 15, 18 kilos for merinos and crossbred lambs is, is so much better. We know every kilo that we get in the lambs, the less issues that we have. So um, if we can get them up over that 15, 18 kilos, then, then really that's, that's where we want to be. Um, yes, we, we have had people, you know, wean earlier, um, under a month old and the like, but look, if you're going to do that, you really need to seek some, some good advice and, and, and ask some pretty good questions and it will take a fair bit of effort, but size of those lambs is going to dictate how we can do it. Early weaning lambs, if we've got an extended lambing, uh, it can be a really problem. And that's why for years, you know, we talk about bringing that lambing, that calving down. But really, you know, if you've got extended lambings, it, it may postpone, uh, pay to postpone that weaning or, or wean older or go in and, and wean heavier lambs only um, and then look at that wet and drying of your ewes and the like. Um, but really, if you can, you know, try to, you know, it's a bit hard when you're in these situations. I do understand that. But, you know, if you've got really big spread of, of lambs um, in weight and size, it, it really is quite difficult. Creek feeding of lambs to get them heavier sooner is a great tool. Um, I, I saw recently a, a producer who had actually set up a creep gate into a loosened paddock and, and the lambs were going in, getting a feed. The ewes weren't going in, although they were loving thought of getting in there but um yeah trying to get them in uh, i have seen people put creeps in in corners of paddocks or in, in next paddock and the like uh, but you know really is one of those things creep feeding it's an old tool that's been around for years and years but it's a very very useful tool and once again what i would say is educate those ewes and lambs together get those lambs used to eating that feed um, and when we start to see a lot most of your lambs coming in and feed, that's telling us that, that they're, they're on and going. And really, you know, experience tells me that you've got to have at least three or four feeds of, of a ewe and lambs together. But don't lose your eyesight. Have a look, see how many lambs are actually coming in. If we're not seeing those lambs come in and eat, then they're not being educated. So really important that you, you keep looking and, and being observant. Really important that if we're early weaning that we provide lambs with a high quality and digestive food. You know, it's got to be very good quality. Uh, protein requirements are, are high, so 14 to 18 percent, depending on, on lamb age, live weight, and energy intakes. But you know, normally whenever I talk drought feeding, I talk energy, energy, energy. But when the second I talk early weaning lambs, you'll hear me talk about protein. What's your protein with the energy? Um, but protein is really, really required for, for appetite. Um, it's needed for wool production and, and, and also muscle development. So really, really is important. Um, you know, one of these things, and, and this is a photo I borrowed from an ex-colleague of mine, Jill Kelly. Um, and, you know, if, and it doesn't have to be very complicated, although you prefer not having the lambs uh, Pull in there, but as, as Jill said, there's always one. Uh, this just gives you a little bit of indication. Red at the top is is a, a 20 kilo lamb versus 30 kilo lamb versus 40 kilo lamb versus 50 kilo lamb at blue at the bottom. On the 
the uh, right hand side you can see the crude pro uh, uh, crude protein or left hand side uh, the crude protein level um, and you can see that there that you know we've got eight up to 18 and you can really see that a 20 kilo lamb at 12 megs of energy really needs roughly around about 16 and a half uh, percent protein at 11 a uh, 30 kilo lamb so roughly around about that 14 um, and you can see as they get heavier the the protein requirements drop if i'm dealing with very very early wean lambs you know so under that 25 kilos um, down 20 20 to 10 kilos then i talk about proteins up around about 18 percent and crude proteins of that the other thing is it's important when I'm talking protein for early wean lambs and calves, I'm talking about true proteins. I'm not talking about using urea or sulfate ammonia to lift the protein percentage of these feeds. Any questions, Jeff? We do. We do. Um, I did answer one on the side, but uh, first question we had from Mark was, um, is the feed cost calculator an app or on the DPI website? Uh, the feed cost calculator is still on the website. It would be lovely if it was an app, uh, but yes, it's 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 on the web. I just have it running on the desktop. Uh, a bit clunky when you try to use it on your mobile phone, but, but you can do it. But um, when I'm sitting down and, and working out rations and the like it's it's the tool i tend to use because i can just chop and change so much yeah and we um we've actually put the link to that feed cost calculator into the chat if anyone wants to uh, jump in there and, and grab that out of there um so quick question for marcus and i think you did cover this but you might just add a little bit more so do you need to feed cows and calves to educate the calves um trail feeding i'm assuming so how long does this normally take calves are an interesting one um doesn't have to be trail feeding it's it's however you feed i know in the past i've just if you're feeding the cows and, and bring them in so I've, I've used tractor tires to introduce them to um, palm kernel meal um, ddg pellets i've also used it for cotton seed and the like so just yeah, however, sometimes it can be just in a trough. Calves tend to we we tend to find aren't quite as bad as sheep um, with that education side of things. But there is definitely a benefit for showing these animals what it is. So if we're going to use canola meal, things like that, if you can find some way of feeding that with them, definitely beneficial, uh, but not quite as. Oh, important as sheep. Sheep really can do do a lot of harm if you don't have them educated. Yeah, very good. Um, and the, the other question we have is, is there, a, is there an advantage in education of by creek feeding? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. A friend of mine uh, in the north of the state, um, and he was talking cattle with this, he said uh, he's never had a shy feeder that he's creek feed. Um, yeah, you know, because they're used to going in, used to getting a feed, uh, and and creep feeding definitely is a great way for educating calves on the feed uh, without having to feed the, the cows. And and it, it is definitely one of my preferences. Uh, I see a lot of producers using it, and and it's a great method to get those calves up going, get them a little bit heavier. But more importantly, when you pull them into the yard, got them into your weaning yard and the like, and you've got a feeder, there's no fear there. They'll go in and have a look. I, I, we saw that at home very much so this year with our calves. Yep, very good. Um, that's all the questions for the moment. Easy. Early wean calves, I thought we'd kick into that. Um, early wean calves, at seven months, there's no benefit from being on the cow. Um, you know, really, uh, there, there are some benefits from weaning early. Uh, if, if we just do it mathematically, there's benefits even in a good year for early weaning. Um, and, and you know, I, I made the fatal error, learned from my mistakes where I went, oh, geez, I've got all this feed, I've got to keep the fat off these cows. 
I'll leave the calves on. No, I still end up with very big fat cows. Um, yeah, so um, really not much benefit there. You know, whereas if I could have actually weaned those calves, got the calves onto the best feed on the place and got the cows to come through behind, I would have diminished the quality of what the cows were able to eat and, and, and not get some of the cows as big as fat as what we had at home. So really no benefit for, for from the, the, the calf being on the cow. Um, look, it's one of those ones as light as 70 kilos and two months of age. I know this gives people conniptions, but there's different steps that, that, that we can do. And, and look, um, just this week alone, I've talked to a couple of people that, that are in the situation where they're looking at, at weaning under 80 kilos and, and there's some light calves and, and they do take a lot of management and a lot of work and you've got to make sure that you're doing it and doing it right. Um, the younger the lie of the calf, the higher the energy and protein levels that, uh, that you require. And the more importance I start to put, put in into the type of protein and also the levels of bypass protein for these very young calves. But the big thing to remember, the younger the lie of the calf, the more issues. So if we can use tools like creep feeding, it, it can be quite beneficial. If you're younger than six weeks, really the options are sell them. Um, if, if you're doing it under six weeks, um, and, and you wean and feed, it's hard work and dollars. You know, there's pellets that you can use, high quality and the like, but there's things that become very, very important. Mob size, you need to be able to see the mob. Um, I, I really cut my mob size back and talk about a maximum 50 calves in those young calves down to that weight. Um, you need to spend some quality time there seeing it. Um, the pasture hay and straw that you're feeding has got to be good. It's got to be good enough that they can get in there. And things like coccidiosis become a risk. So, you know, really ensuring that, you know, the feed's clean um, and, and you've got to be on top of any health issues as they pop, pop up. Uh, delay marking, branding, dehorning. Just don't don't get stuck into it. You don't want to stress them. Um, if, if you are in the situation where you're, uh, having to do that, I really would recommend pain relief. I can't stress it enough. Um, anything to reduce the stress on these early morning calves at this level is, is really, really important. And the same with lambs, you know, that definitely in that scenario where we're not going to that level that, you know, that pain relief is pretty important. Older than six weeks, you know, we can get, get by, we can get by on a, a protein meal and rough fish, we can get by on high quality pellets. Um, you know, it's one of those ones that, um, you know, you can still sell them, but, you know, you can, can get there going with these. Um, older than 12 weeks, 100 plus kilos, it's far much, far easier. Um, you know, we can sell them, we can worm feed grain roughage. We can get start to use molasses diets, uh, fortified molasses diets. This is what I'm talking about for those on on the coast with access to that or uh, where they've got setups. Um, once again, we can use protein mills. We can also use things like legume grains and the like as well with roughage. So really. Uh, once we get that little bit extra weight in, it becomes far more easier to, to manage. But you know, really, that 100 over 120 kilos, really, you know, we we don't require as high quality feed. Under 120, you'll hear me talk about 18 percent protein. Like once again, some of the tools that are out there is creek feeding. This is uh, uh, photos. They're old photos now of, of a guy that used creep feeding for his calves and it it was a pretty simple mix. It was uh yarrow oats and and uh, and some legume grains in there. Uh, he just had feeders out in the paddock and and you know the calves they're curious, they've gone in, they they start eating and, and all of a sudden he was able to get them up. You know, admittedly this was a bit better time when we when I was taking these photos. Uh, but to give you a bit of an idea, the, the photo at the bottom of the wieners, that, that's a mob of wieners that after a curfew all weighed over 300 kilos by about um, well, prior to seven months of age. So, you know, 
able to do it, yes, it was a bit better year, but it does give you that little bit of boost and a benefit. So things like creek feeding. Recommendations for, for sheep and cattle. This is one of these ones that we talk about. Uh, troughs, it, this is minimum sizes that we talk about. We talk about single-sided access, 30 centimetres for, for old animals. The more space that you can give them, the more access you can give them, the less issues that we tend to see with, with dominance behaviour uh, and the like. And the more space that we tend to get there, the more likely they are to come in and feed. Um, Double-sided access can help as well, particularly when it's split up the middle, that sheep can eat from both sides. Um, but self-feeders, we talk about three to five centimetres per head. So that gives us 110 to 120 per 2.4 metre feeder. Um, you know, just, just one of those ones. Um, but once again, more is best. You know, if you've you've got less animals in in that trying to compete at, at a feeder or at a trough, it really will have have a uh, benefit. Cattle, if we're looking at single sided, um, we talk about thirty centimetres for, for weaners. Um, you know, fifteen centimetres for double sided. We talk about three to seven centimetres or hundred to seventy to hundred weaners. Or, to 2.4 metre feeder. Uh, what I would say is uh, silo feeders, obviously with, with the heads angling in, we can actually get a few more animals around those feeders. Uh, but once again, you know, here's one of those things that, you know, if we can get that, um, you know, a little bit more space around, it's really, really important. What I would say also is um, just, just make sure you're having a look Sometimes it can be worthwhile if you're using feeders to actually spread them out. Um, you know, so if there's a bit of anim some animals dominating a feeder, if you can spread them out, you know, it can help a little bit with some of that dominance. Water, uh, look, this is one of those no-brainers, and and you know, if I talk about confinement feeding, um, it's it's one of the first things I talk about. I talk about need for clean water. It's got to be you know, don't have boggy water points. So if um, recently saw, saw a feeder, uh, but a water trough, sorry, that, that um, had water around the edge, there was no troubles with the quality of the water, but all the lambs were only drinking from one end, um, you know, because they weren't treading in the water. You know, so that was limiting access, it was limiting the amount that were coming in. So really one of those things. The other thing is feed away from the water. And this trough photo here, I've got a great example. This had actually been cleaned the day, the afternoon before I was out there in the morning and already you could see some of that feed starting to come into that trough. Um, so so one of those things that's really important that we, if you're gonna feed, feed a little bit further away. If you're gonna clean that water out, which I say is, is a given, uh, it's really important that that you get that water away from that trough and don't get wet spots. The other thing I would say is, and, and talking to a work colleague, Lauren um, here, who's done work in, in, in uh, feedlots and the like, she was saying how even with some of their stuff that they end up having to put bigger aprons on some of the troughs and lifting some troughs up a little bit higher because of the dust coming on. I've actually seen situations where animals have come in uh, and stopped drinking because and it's cheaper particularly for this uh, because of film of dust on the water. So check your water, clean it. If you're seeing animals queuing up, then there's usually an issue. Um, and particularly with these young animals, um, it's important that we do it. The other one that I would say is, um, and, and uh, it's something I've seen a few times, if I start to see neck cranking where animals are putting their chin up and over, trying to bend their heads over and drink, that really is restricting how much they're able to drink. So sometimes, and, and I've seen this where people have gone and got tyres and put, put down along the edge or, or sleepers along the edge so that young lambs and young calves can actually step up on that and still get a drink. So be aware of that. General advice, the younger they are, the smaller the mob. So true. Um, you know, 
if we're looking at it, maximum for cattle, I talk about 100 in a mob um, and three to 400 for lambs. Really, you need to cut that right back if you're really early weaning lambs. Um, you need to be able to see where you're having issues, work out those shy feeders. I know with another colleague of mine here, we're out at uh, uh, a confinement feeding area looking at some, some ram lambs and straight away standing there, we could see you know, six or seven animals standing off and talking to the producer, he's saying he end up pulling eight. And you know, pretty much we could have seen those. Would have been handy if we had a paint gun. We could have uh, marked them up straight away. I don't think work will quite bunt me for, for going out with paint guns, but something to think about. Like for like, uh, and the way, the analogy I use for this, um, don't, don't try to put a prop forward. You know, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet, and if you've got a prop forward versus a halfback, chances are your prop forward's going to get more feed than your halfback. Um, you know, so like with like, don't try to put, you know, a 25 kilo lamb against an 18 kilo lamb. They're just not going to compete. You know, so you know, same with a you know 180 kilo calf versus 120. 120 kilo calf is just not going to compete. Really important to set up a hospital pen. Um, even myself, we end up getting two sick calves out of 107 at home with a relatively benign feed, etc., etc., etc. So yeah, you, you're going to need a hospital pen. Shy feeders, they're always going to be a problem. Um, please forgive me, anyone out there, but I always say shy feeders, you're better off letting them be someone else's problem. Get them, bring them in, sell them because what we tend to find with shy feeders, they're the ones that, that will get subclinical acidosis, they'll get OEA, you'll, you'll get eye issues, all the rest of it. So get them out. Um, don't set and forget, spend some quality time. And this is a photo I've pinched of, of um, ex-work colleague, Jill Kelly. And, and this is an example that, that she had at a producer where the animals were cranking their head over. And a lot of the issue was that they were actually not able to eat it was too deep, it was too high for them, and they couldn't get their head in there. So once again, important that you do spend some time there, look at what's actually going on, look at those animals, where they're going in and out, what, what's actually happening. Um, it's, it's very valuable time if you're really, really early winning. The other thing to consider is sites. Where are you going to actually put it? Um, this is a producer that, that I've worked with in the past. He's got a very good little setup there. It's a site that he can access. Um, I know in that district I, I did work years ago with a spot bloke set up a beautiful feeding area. It was you know it was great. It was near his shed. It was near his yards. He had great road uh, where he's feeding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It was great until they got a summer storm and got four inches of rain, which really had problems of those animals getting in. Uh, to that feed it really caused huge issues though of getting feed into those animals. Um, and you know, so site and location, make sure it's it's you know right. Health treatments, you need to be up, talk to the vets, have a yarn to them. Um, they're a great resource in LLS. Um, look at that side of things, you know, what you know, do we look at um, you know, vaccines, fly treatments, et cetera, for, for calves. Um, you know, what do we actually need? The other big one is get a feed test, don't guess. Um, uh, just today I was talking about some variations we're seeing in some of the feed tests and I mentioned it earlier. Um, the other one is if you need help, get some help, particularly when you're looking at these very early wean calves, get, get help des designing a ration, look at what you need. Um, the other thing too is sell feeders and troughs. There's pros and cons with both. Troughs are a great thing. You're there, tend to be there more regular, but you know, if you're spreading it out and and uh, you know, only feeding once a day, sometimes it, you will get more shy feeders. Feeding twice a day, sometimes it can mask some of the issues. There's pros and cons with both. Uh, weigh it up, look what works. Um, you know, uh, just try to to manage it yourself, but just think it think it through. How's it going to work for your system? I think we're 
at the end. Um, is hopefully we've, we've covered a fair bit of ground fairly quickly there, Jeff. But uh, any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, we uh, we've we've wrapped them all up for the moment, but um, we might just see if anyone might have a, a last quick question they want to um, throw into the to the tab there. Um, just just while people might be thinking or typing that in, um, something we'll just plug is that tomorrow or in the next day or so you'll receive a recording for anyone who's attended tonight of the tonight's webinar. With that recording, there will also be a um, a little survey so we'd really be keen for to get some um, responses on the survey um, if you've joined joined us tonight some feedback on what you thought and any topics you might want to cover in the future or um, anything uh, yeah anything else you might want us to uh, to cover locally would be really good um, this is our last webinar in this series for this year uh, we will look to um, do some more planning on what we might do in next year so uh, Brett um, just a couple of questions have come in. What is spike feeding? Sorry, I missed it. Uh, what is spike feeding? S P I K E. Have you uh, oh, heard of that one? Yeah, spike feeding, where we speak, feed a protein supplementation. So, where, where, you know, there was work done by David Hennessy and Co. There's been work up north, look at a protein supplement for cows uh, or even with sheep where high energy just to help them dovulate, get more animals um, getting in calf. So that's what I talk about when I'm talking about spike feeding. Uh, it's, yeah. it's an in increase of feed for your cows or your ewes to, to sort of try to get more in calf. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep, gotcha. Well, I think in, uh, in down in the southern area here, we use a different term, but know what you're talking about. Um, so another question we got here is, um, how big an area needed for weaning calves, say 30 calves? Uh, 30 calves, it really comes down to sort of, you know, we talk about, you know, 10, 10 to 12 square metres per calf, um, you know, Really, you can get away with a bit less um, to start off with, but you know, really, you 30 calves, it's not too not too hard. So you know, you know, realistically, that you know, 10 to 10 to 12 square meters. Uh, but a lot of that information, if people are actually looking at spacing, can be found in the confinement feeding manual, where for both sheep and cattle. Um, is is probably the best place to go and actually look at that, and um, it, that's that's available on the LLS website. Yep, great. Um, would you recommend VRD or pink eye vaccination with early weaning? Uh, VRD, I'd definitely be having a yarn to a vet and and look at the option, uh, particularly if you know you have have issues, um, and I would definitely be looking at it prior to early weaning, um, you know, sort of say you can get them a bit set up. Um, pink eye is one of these ones, it's it's definitely, uh, depending on your location and like, what I would say is I would treat to minimise flies. Um, so I'd get a fly treatment for, for, for calves to try to get them off uh, the head and make sure you're getting it up on the, the pole and the like. Uh, the other thing too, and I didn't mention it tonight, uh, I hate overhead hay racks for early worm calves. Number one, uh, calves and lambs, they, they eat up, the dust and material falls into their eyes, um, falls in their nose, we get more damage to the eyes than the like. Um, so, so that's one of those ones. Back end of 18, 19, um, we did see some areas that had used uh, pink eye vaccination for a number of years, um, all of a sudden had, had problems because they had a different strain. So, but what I can say is through good nutrition, we can minimise some of the, the nasty effects, but definitely is something that I put in the mix. But once again, depends on your area where you are, what your history is, et cetera. Yep, great. Uh, another question here. I've got a few coming in actually. Uh, techniques for educating weaners when putting them onto pellets or the meals. Yeah, tricks of the trade. How do we do it? Um, 
what I would say with early wean lambs, and I know one of those ones where I've actually seen it where people are using C-section and, and I've got a producer swear, swears by this for, for his, his lambs, is actually lifting it up a little bit, um, having it raised off the ground. And what he's found there with the early wean lambs is that they walk in and you know, they're looking around and all of a sudden they, they'll kick the trough and put their head down. Um, so that's, that's one of those ones. Uh, calves, same story, getting them over. I generally don't have many issues with getting calves on canola meal. They, they tend to find that very, very palatable. Uh, DDG pellets, same with those. They tend to find them a bit palatable. Um, but if I'm having trouble getting sheep or lambs or onto a onto a new feed, then I look at um, making up a bit of a mix with molasses. So I go uh, four parts water, one part molasses in just a little um, spray uh, container. You can buy them from Mitre 10 or Bunnings or whatever, and just spraying that over the top of the, of the pellets. Um, that sweetness of the molasses tends to get the animals on. They come and, and have a go. But definitely, you know, if they're not going near those areas where you've got the pellets, etc., getting those animals in that area. What I would also do is this is where things like potty calves, other things that have been used to being fed, become very, very useful. Um, you know, yeah. Uh, if if you're in the situation where you've got some you know, stud cows with young calves on, they've been fed, fed with their mum. Putting those animals in 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 the mix will all of a sudden show these other animals um, where the feed is. I have actually seen blokes that will will yard wean one lot of calves, have leave a couple of those calves in there that are used to eating, used to getting onto that feed and put another mob in there with them. Um, and that does does help as well just to educate those animals to go to that feed. Yeah. Yep, um, you probably covered this one a little bit, but um, how can we prevent pink eye in early wean calves and how best to deal with those that have it? Uh, early wean calves, pink eye, it's, it's a perennial problem. <laughs> get that fly treatment on them, get good nutrition into them um, and avoid overhead hay racks like the plague. I know this is one of those ones that I've had issues with where people say, oh, I've never had a problem. Uh, I've had enough problems to say it's no longer a coincidence um, where I've gone out and, and really see those calves with their heads in underneath and just dropping that material down into their eyes. Um, it, it really is one of those ones, but I would definitely, any of those fly treatments, you know, get it up onto the actual pole of the animal and, and get that cover up on that head, you know, so that you keep those flies away. You can look at fly control around your own place, but you know, definitely, you know, once you start to see that that pink eye, treat it. There's having under the vets. I'm I'm a bit of a fan of the cream and what I do at home. Uh, and look, we all get it at times. Um, is um, get a patch, use old jeans, and glue it. Get that protection onto that eye. Um, and you know, if there's if there's issues starting to happen with the calf, pull him out, put him in the sick pen. To treat them a little bit differently. Yeah, great. Um, question here on shade. So, is shade important? Is some shade okay, or do you need to provide enough for all or none at all uh, due to crowding in the shade? Oh, the old, the old shade question. Um, uh, yeah, look, an an aspect of the shade's really important. Where it is, um, uh, is is one of those ones. Definitely for for cattle and particularly in some of the environments, I'm I'm a big fan of shade and and a bit of uh, you know, but it's got to dry out underneath it. Um, uh, how you set it up, that's that's a question for for another day. There's a fair bit to this one, but it should be any shade that you do set up should be on a a sort of a north south aspect don't have it on an east west aspect uh, if you have it on an east west aspect it tends not to dry out underneath because the sun just moves through it's across the sky whereas in the north south the sun will come 
rise in the east set and the west and all of a sudden it dries in and out underneath it. Uh, my preference would be at least trying to have enough shade set up for, for roughly, you know, 20 to 30 percent of your animals at any one stage. But yeah, that's pretty important. But what I would say for calves, and we know this is for cattle, is be really careful you don't affect wind flow. Um, you, they need to get the air moving through. Um, it's important, otherwise uh, they will start to heat sheep. Uh, you know, we know that they're very good at, at lying down, not getting the reflection, getting the head in bits of shade, putting in and under. The other thing too, and, and I didn't talk about this with water, is shading water. You know, water that's hot, they won't drink as much. You know, that if they're not drinking water, they're not, they, they tend not to eat. Uh, I've seen people put shade over water with sheep, uh, particularly where they've been using these uh, poly type troughs, where they're, they're uh, PVC troughs, sorry, where they're not quite, you know, they're trying not to get them to heat. Um, what ends up happening is you end up with animals going in and lying in, in that shade that restricts access, restricts animals coming in. So shade's a real difficult one. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely my preference that we do have a bit of shade there for them. Yep, great. Um, another question from a uh, question from Glenn is, uh, could you please discuss dry matter requirements, which is probably a fairly big topic. Uh, yeah, as in to how much or how dry the feed. Yeah, it's sort of dry matter requirements. If if we're looking at it. Um, you know, with the really early one calves, I like to give them ab lib roughage um, and, and a good quality roughage with with a pellet, um, depending, uh, well, with a with an energy and protein feed going with it. Um, you know, depending on their size, I'm talking about with them sort of needing, you know, sort of roughly around about that, oh, depends on the size, but really three quarters to, to a kilo and a half per head per day, depends on the roughage and, and the like. Use those calculators, give you a bit of an indicator, uh, but it is really important that they do eat eat that protein pellet or legume or, or protein meal um, that you've got in there. But yeah, so that for carbs, uh, for lambs, um, you know, really same story, use the calculators, but on a, you know, sort of kilos of feed wise, and you know, we're, we're really talking about needing those animals, both calves and lambs, sort of somewhere in the vicinity, depending on the energy, sort of being in excess of one and a half percent of their life weight on a dry matter team. Sorry, the mozzies are just coming out. <laughs> <laughs> that time of the day. Um, yeah. A couple more. Uh, question from Fred is, uh, is it better to confine calves to a small area? Um, of thinking in the early weaning situation, I'd say. Yes, definitely. Don't have them out in the paddock wandering around. You'll end up with them, you know, you've got to be able to have them in, in that small area so you can actually look at what's going on and pick up any issues. Um, and look, yeah, it really is important that you spend some quality time there and have a look. Don't just dump the feed and walk away. You need to be monitoring what is actually going on. And I can't stress how important it is clean the water regularly. Yeah, you know, if you start to have issues with the water, we'll start to have issues with the feeding. Uh, it's it's a domino effect. Uh, but yep, definitely worthwhile to restrict them up pretty well. But yeah, you know, still allow them the space to do ground and the like. But and particularly you know, if, if you've got a, you know, a mob that's sort of on the upper end of what we look at size wise, uh, you've got to allow animals to get off into their social groups. We all know we've got mates, you know, friends and cattle and sheep are the same. Uh, they tend to like to go off with, with, with their mates and stay away from yeah. the bullies or the ones that give them a hard time. Yep. Great. Um, question around fly treatment products, suggestions for eliminating flies around the calf head. Do you got any um, favourites? Uh, this is where I can get into trouble. Um, look, uh, easy doses. Um, I think it used to be rest easy dose uh, is one. I know I've used at home swish, um, yeah, and the likes. There's a number of different products out there. 
I know one of the ones that used to be great, but you can't buy it anymore. <laughs> it was, it, it, it killed fleas, flies, everything. Um, but, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, really it's, it's that arrest or, or one of those types, but, uh, have you under one of the beds, um, talk to them and see what's, what's, what's out there. But yeah, easy dose was a good one. Swish was a product I've used. Um, there's, there's a couple of different ones out there. Yep, great. Uh, and just a question, similar line is around, um, Brett just mentioned what type of fly treatment to help prevent pink eye. Can you get it from an ag reseller or is it a bad product? Uh, ag reseller, yep. Ag reseller. Yep, yep. yep. For, the, for the vaccination. For, but same story, you've got to have that early you don't want to be seeing the pink eye issues and then give it because I've had producers um, use the pink eye vaccination and then and when you go out they go oh it hasn't worked it's all terrible yeah and you go out oh when did you start well we started to have some eyes issues so we've stuck well, that's when we went this needs to be planned in advance um, and and go in there and what I would say is also we you know. If some, some of these areas, these cars haven't seen green feed for a while, think about a shot of ADME. Um, you know, if they haven't had that green feed, you've got them on cereal haze, and cereal grains and the like. Um, and ADME, we know that, that that we can see an increase in pink eye issues if, if there is an issue. It's not the cure-all, don't, don't get me wrong, but you know, for some areas where these calves have never had green feed, it's definitely one to be putting in the toolbox. Yeah, great. Um, another one here. You mentioned earlier, Brett, you feed not the cheapest way, but it works. Can you elaborate on this? What are some of the, your shortcuts or <laughs> preferred methods, even if they don't, if they do cost slightly more? <laughs> Cotton seed, um, seven hundred odd dollars a ton. It's it's got out there, hasn't it? Um, uh, I've used cottonseed, D Lena cottonseed. We fed a lot of that during the drought because we could able to feed twice weekly with it. Um, palm kernel meal is another one that I, I like feeding my cows. Proteins on the lower end, you've got to add something to it for, for early wean carbs and lambs. Um, palatability issues at times with it. Um, you know, but you know, what, I got quoted $550 a tonne to get it landed at home. Uh, currently, so yeah, look, there there are a couple of little ones that I look at, um, but that's because I can't feed be there every day. I've got to be able to feed uh, with a bit of a break in between, um, and and also I've got to have something that, that my family can handle if if I'm off football, giving feeding advice or doing field days. So uh, <laughs> it's one of those ones. Um, yeah, there's a few of those different bits and pieces I know. Uh, lupins and the like, you know, um, you can feed them semi-regularly um, as well. So there's there's some of these things that we look at. Um, you know, it, it's, at times it's not, you know, exactly a balanced up ration. We haven't got the right protein with the right energy. Uh, in times we've got too much protein, but um, you know, it's 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 what you can make work. Um, also, you know, at the moment fetch hay. Is, is great value for money uh, when you start doing your sums. Do your sums, see what's out there. Um, you know, and, and you know, I, I used a lot of canola hay, but there's huge variations in canola hay. I'm seeing some of the tests out there now. Um, you know, get a feed test, have a look at it. Yeah, do the numbers, because not always the cheapest is the best. That's for sure. No, I love molasses mixes. And we used a lot of molasses when I grew up on the coast. Uh, I don't use it at Mudgee because it's I'm not set up for it. <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, um, I think we're nearly nearly at the end there. We've got one question around: Can we send out the Q and A uh, with the presentation tomorrow? Um, we'll have a we'll see what we can do about that. Otherwise, it'll be in the recording anyway. So we uh, we you might have to go back and rewatch the back end of the. The webinar um, but we will see what we can do about that um any final comments there brett look um thanks very much for having us on tonight um you're not alone uh if people are 
what I would say is, and, and the joy of mine and your job, Jeff, is we get to go out and have a look. Uh, what I would say is if you get the chance, you know, a neighbour is doing something, go and have a look. Uh, it's same with confinement feeding areas, setting up a feeding area and the like. Go and have a look at someone else's. Um, if you get the chance, get out of your own dung heap, go and have a look um, and, and see what's out there. But really what I would say at the moment, um, I had a producer yesterday rang me and said, oh, I've been quoted this. I said, oh, he's having a tough go at you. Oh, but I've always got food from there and, and it's always good. Well, that's good, but I'm telling you, that's about $100 a ton over what I can get for the same same product. And so spend some time. Um, I know we had a guy you know, talking about it there today at the workshop we were at this afternoon where he mentioned about, you know, spend a bit of time to, to investigate. And he was talking about the market side of things, but I would also say spend a bit of time, make a few phone calls, talk to some other people. Um, Joy's about my job, I get people ringing me, I don't have to ring and ask, but ring some other people, see what they've got. Um, we, we know there's, there's, there can be some variation out there. Um, and look, really get a food test <laughs> and, and, and do your sums. Yeah, and I'd also add to that, um, Brett, that if there are some small groups of landholders that all want to have a similar chat, we're happy to come along and facilitate a bit of a, a conversation and work through a few issues that might be around locally. Um, happy to happy to do that. Yep, definitely. So get in touch and, and more than happy to come out and be involved. Yep. One one final question. Um, can I feed just whole lupins and oat and hay to wean lambs? From Corinne, so she's talking twenty percent lupins and eighty percent oat and hay. Uh, yes, you can feed whole whole lupins. Uh, lupins are better crack than they are whole to, to cattle. Um, lupins are the great thing. Uh, you just want to do your numbers on what the oat and hay is and whether you're going to get get the protein levels up up enough. Um, so it comes back to what protein that oat and hay is. Um, you may have to, at 20%, I suggest without doing the numbers and knowing the protein of the oats, oat and hay, that you're probably going to have to up the um, amount of lupins to, if you're early weaning type lambs and trying to get 16 plus percent protein. Uh, if you're dealing with albus lupins, they'll tend to be about 32%. Um, uh, sorry, uh, narrow leaf and gustafolia, they'll tend to be about 32% uh, protein. Um, so if you're only feeding 20%, I'd say you may have to bump, bump that number up depending on the protein level of, of, of uh, your hay. Yeah, really good scenario to run through the drought feed calculator and um, with, your, with your feed test at hand. Really is, and yeah, great way of doing it. I do it roughly in my head and say you're probably underdoing it. <laughs> yep, yep. Very good. Well, um, we might wrap it up there, Brett. Thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, I hope you got a bit out of what we presented or what Brett's presented. Um, the recording will be on your uh, email in the, in the next day or so once it's uh, ready to go out. And, um, yeah, appreciate you spending your time with us. And thanks, Brett, for the great presentation. Thanks very much. And apologies again for the blackout, but uh, had nothing to do with me. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think if we hang around here much more longer, Brett, we won't be able to see you, so we better um, say goodnight. Good night, everyone. Thank you. See ya.